Amen. Okay, Mark, uh, Luke chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading with verse 26. So Christmas from heaven's perspective. Last week we dealt with the concept of the incarnation and what it, me what it meant when Jesus came to earth and he became flesh. This week I'm going to deal with the virgin birth and how that is a, is a, a mystery just like the incarnation is, but um, I want to use another term beyond mystery and that is miracle. The virgin birth was just a flat out miracle. Amen. And Christmas is about miracles. Amen. Amen. So let's read Luke chapter 1 verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Amen. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Can we say that together? For with God, nothing will be impossible. Can you look at someone sitting next to you and say, For with God, nothing will be impossible. Christmas is about miracles. It's about miracle. Last week we talked about the Son of God coming down and why the whys of the incarnation. And it's a mystery. It's a complete mystery that God who was, you know, if you think about the Son of God, the ancient theologian said he was eternally begotten of the Father, meaning that he lives in this eternal procession, this eternal begottenness of God. And then he had no birth, he had no beginning, he will have no end because he's eternal. But then there was another begotten of the Son. He came in the form of a man from the Virgin Mary. So there was like two births, they, the ancient theologians would say, one is eternal and one is temporal. But if we go beyond that and look at why a virgin birth, why through Mary, why did God choose to use this method to bring the Son of God into earth? We, un we unravel, we open up an amazing mystery and an amazing miracle. It began actually in Genesis chapter 3. When God told the serpent who deceived Eve, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Meaning there's coming someone from the line of the woman who would come and crush the head of the serpent. And if we want to read deeper into this, we realize that the head represents authority or power or seat of authority. And so there's coming one that will crush the seat of authority of the enemy over mankind and over the earth realm. Hallelujah. And this seed of the woman would be the Messiah, would be the Son of God. Now in the Old Testament, there were many miraculous births, but none a virgin birth. In the Old Testament, we see Abraham and Sarah and Sarah, when she was like 100 years old or thereabouts or 90 or something, having a son by pure miracle because she was beyond the age of childbearing. We see Hannah who was barren and went to the temple and prayed that God would give her a son or the tabernacle. And what happens? She has the son 
Samuel, and it, it becomes a miracle. We see the birth of Samson was really kind of miraculous with the, an anonymous lady giving birth to this judge, Samson. So there have been many miraculous births or births aided by God, but each one of those involved a man and a woman. But when he chose to come down as the Son of God, he chose only to use a woman and that woman to be a virgin at that. So when the angel came and announced this to Mary, she was like amazed and she was like, how could this be? Verse 35, she's asking, how can this be? And the angel responds and says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So just like in the book of Genesis when the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Now the Spirit comes in that same creative capacity and hovers over the person of Mary to create again a body for the Son of God. Same way we see it, I believe, in John chapter 20, if you were with me Wednesday night in Bible study, that John chapter 20, that the Spirit of God was given, I believe, when Jesus said, receive the Spirit, breathed upon His disciples. I believe that same creative force came into their life right then, and that marked their point of being born again. I mean, maybe that's speculation, but I just kind of think that was a point of them being born again, receiving the creative work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Miracles. Can you say it with me? Yes. Miracles. So why a virgin? Why a virgin? Why did God choose to do it this way? Well, I, th there are several different things that hit me about this. First of all, I don't think that God needed a man to accomplish what he was getting ready to do. He didn't need a man. And, and having said that, no man was going to take credit for what was getting ready to happen. It was God who overshadowed Mary. The Spirit performed the miracle of creativity. Also, no sin was going to be involved in this deal. Because if a man would have gotten involved, maybe there would have been a tendency for pride or for lust or for ambition or something to get in the way. But God was going to have none of that. This was going to be free from all of that. And He was going to do it by His hand upon a willing handmaiden. Also, maybe God was, uh, there, there's something in the mix here with Melchizedek in the Old Testament. If you remember Melchizedek being the priest of Salem who came and uh, Abraham gave him tithe of all the spoils of war. And, and then over in the book of Hebrews it said Melchizedek had no father. And, and that Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So in the same way, he was going to come with no earthly father. And then finally, and maybe this is a stretch but if we dig deep in theology, it means something that, that by being born without a natural father, but through a, an earthly mother, Christ was one person, not two. What do I mean by that? If he would have had an earthly father, there would have been confusion here, and he could have been considered two persons, like the ancient Nestorians believed. They believed that Christ was, in effect, two people, one God and one man. And they argued this because they couldn't reconcile God going to the cross and suffering and dying. So they said there must have been two of him. And we believe that the ancient Nestorian doctrine influenced Muhammad, the founder of Islam. We, we, you can read from history that he was influenced by an ancient Nestorian monk. And some of his ideas about Jesus, I think, come from that heretical line of Christianity. Also, there was a group in the ancient world known as the Ebionites. And they believed that Jesus was actually born of Joseph. That he was just a natural person in that regard. And the early fathers considered that heresy as well. Then there's another doctrine called docetism where that they believe Jesus didn't have a physical body at all. That he just appeared to be physical because how could God have a physical body? They couldn't figure this out. So Jesus was just an illusion. But thank God for the ancient fathers and for the church and for the doctrines that have come down to us that he was fully God and fully man, born of a virgin, without the hand of man, only the Holy Spirit overshadowing her, miracle. Amen. Can you say miracle? Amen. Complete, total miracle. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So I have three takeaways from this. 
I have three takeaways from this. The annunciation, the announcing of Christ. If you go with us to Israel next uh, November, we probably will visit the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth, and it's a really uh, a cool place to go. Amen? Where Mary, where she received the vision of the angel, and he announced to her. So, okay, that's sideline. Let's go. Three things, three takeaways from this. Number one, God placed a woman Okay, I ain't even finished yet. Hang on now. God placed a woman in a key vital role in the plan of redemption. God placed a woman in a vital key role in the plan of redemption. Many people and skeptics who look at Christianity say, well, Christianity is a sexist religion because Eve sinned in the garden and y'all blame women for all of the problems. No, come on now, watch. <laughs> Men need to stay quiet during this period right here. So. But yeah, some people look at Christianity and say, well, it's sexist because women, you look at a woman as a problem, but, no, but, but they need to think about the virgin birth. Because yeah, okay, Eve did fall first, but then Adam, where was Adam? He was off watching football or something while he should have been taking care of his wife, you know. But anyhow. But then we come to the New Testament, and who does God use to bring redemption about but another woman? And the ancient theologians believed that Eve was virgin because it said that Adam knew her after they came out of the garden. So they believed she was virginal in the garden. And they believed just as the virgin Eve fell, that the virgin Mary made up for all of her issues. Something very profound to think about. So God used a woman in a key role. Now think about this. In the life of Jesus, God used women in his life, and they became some of his most devout, committed followers. And not only that, when he went to the cross, they're the only ones left except the apostle John who hung with him. And not only that, when he rose from the dead, who was it? It was the women that ran to the tomb first. And the women were going to anoint his body. And here they see that, he, that, that, that the, the body is gone. And then they come out of there and they meet the gardener and they hear the good news. They think he was the gardener, but he's really the angel of the Lord. And tells them the good news and they run with the good news and go back. And they get the privilege of being the first ones to announce that Jesus had risen and they got to tell the disciples about it. Hallelujah. And then in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, here's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and other women with the apostles and they're all filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. So women, y'all need to shout right now and say hallelujah. <laughs> so God used a woman in a powerful way. Second takeaway I have from this is that Mary, now work with me here. I've never looked at it this way, but Mary represents the unworthiness of man. Now, I, we highly regard Mary. She will be praised for generations, the Bible says, and I believe that. And she was, I believe, a pure uh, virgin, a committed, a devout believer. I believe that. But nonetheless... Just as all of us have to come through the cross, Mary had to go through the cross. She had to come through faith in the Lord Jesus. She was in the upper room with the rest of the apostles in Acts chapter 2, receiving the Holy Spirit like they received the Holy Spirit. So in a way, we can say Mary was such a model and she was uh, so great, but yet she was nonetheless human. She was nonetheless a human like you and I are, and she represents all of us who are not worthy of what God brings to us. Amen? Isn't this, even if you read the song of Mary, I don't have any notes, I'm just thinking about it, but if you read the song of Mary, we call the Magnificat in Latin, it comes over in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 46. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. He has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. And then she goes on down, and she praises God. It's like 
she re, re, God has realized how lowly I am and how common I am. And it causes her to break forth in song and praise. So she, in essence, represents all of us. Hilary of Portiers in 4th century said, Human nature, without any precedent merits of good works, was joined to God the Word in the womb of the Virgin without any precedent merits of good works. She brought nothing of, of worthiness to the table, just like you and I don't. Ephesians chapter 2, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. in Christ by grace you've been saved and raised us up together, made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship. We're not bringing works to the table. He does the work in us. And this is the beauty of Mary. Here's this young maiden and she's standing here and she receives this vision and this announcement from the Lord. And when she receives it, it blows her away. Amen. Who am I? Same thing when God comes to us. The response should be the same. Who am I? Who am I that I'm worthy to stand here? Well, guess what? We're not worthy. But he comes in his mighty grace and his power. Third takeaway I have, and this is to Mary's credit, she was willing and obedient to what God was going to do in her life. She was willing and obedient. She had a willingness to submit her will to the will of the Lord. And willingness is really what matters. I know some say, no, even our will gets mixed up in, um, in works. That's why you have the extreme Calvinist line that says not even, the will is not even involved. But I don't, I'm not that extreme. I believe God gives us the power of will and he gives us prevenient grace that enables us to turn to him when he calls. And so I believe Mary here, God had prepared her. And then when he called, she realizes her unworthiness. But yet she's completely willing and she's completely obedient and willing to God. And it's amazing. She has to know what kind of problems and what kind of rumors this thing's going to cause. Does she not? I mean, she has to know the culture she grew up in. She's betrothed. She's never known a man. She's going to be pregnant. This ain't looking good. But nonetheless, she rejoiced over the word of the angel. Did she not? She rejoiced and she started singing and breaking out in song because she realized that this was a God thing and not a man thing. Amen. And so it is with us that Mary represents our willingness to come and say, Lord, I lay it all down at your feet and I'm willing. You come and do whatever you want to in my life. Can somebody say Amen. John chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. The key is the will. If anyone wills to do his will, he'll know my words are true, Jesus is saying. How many is willing in here this morning? Hallelujah. And, and as we wind all this down, so the virgin birth had to be. It had to be this way. And we see now the mystery of it and the wonder of it, the beauty of it, the wisdom of it. But I want to hammer home something here that I want, I want ringing in your ears when you leave here. And that is the virgin birth was a complete and total miracle. It wasn't something we could figure out. It's one of those theological mysteries like I preached about last week. It's something we can't figure out. It's something God has to give us by divine revelation. And we receive it and we rejoice and it changes our lives. That's what the virgin birth was. It wasn't something we say, oh, I see how, why God did that. No, it's like, I have no idea why he did that. And it sounds strange to the ears of man, but yet it was a miracle, and I receive it as a miracle, and I don't want to take anything away from it. Thank God for manger scenes. 
Thank God for the Virgin Mary. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Christmas story. Thank God for all that. Because there are many people today who would love to take all the miracles and take them right out of this Bible and throw them away because it offends their intellect and it offends their sense of uh, them having everything figured out and all together. I was talking to Logan the other night. And I told him of a book I just purchased because of some research I was doing in ancient church documents, and I purchased it by a certain professor, and he had studied under a disciple of this guy. And the guy's brilliant. He's one of the foremost Greek scholars and Greek, what we call Greek critical scholars in the world, and studied under arguably the greatest Greek textual scholar on earth. But so, so anyhow, I, I was using his work for uh, a lot of you come and ask me about other Gospels, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Thomas. A lot of y'all ask me about that stuff. I'd love to just teach on it sometime on Wednesday night so you could get the full, my view on it all. So there were a lot of other Gospels. So anyhow, I was studying in these other Gospels, Apocryphal Acts of Peter, Apocryphal Acts of uh, Paul, and blah, 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 blah. And so I bought this guy's book. And so I thought, well, after I spoke to Logan, I thought, I'm going to research and see about this guy's life. And I looked into his life and found out that he was a fundamentalist, born-again Christian. Went to Moody Bible Seminary and went to Wheaton, uh, Moody Bible College and Wheaton Seminary. And I thought, hey, all right, man. But then he said he went to Princeton and did a Ph.D. in Greek textual criticism and became an agnostic and lost his faith. And now travels around the country debating evangelical scholars who believe in all this stuff. I thought, Wow. How can you be so brilliant and miss the core? Well, it's very possible. That's why I warn all the students who go out of here to college, man. Let college build you and let college strengthen you. And let all those divergent views and, and opposing views strengthen your faith, not destroy your faith. Because at every place I've been, I've had to fight my own intellectual battles. But each one of them have served to make me stronger in the end. But I think it's, it's that we, we, get so, we get above our raisins. Y'all know that term down here? You get above your raisin and you like think you know more than you do. And we think we know more than God sometimes. And then we just say, miracles? No, that can't happen. That can't happen. So you have scholars out there who say, well, we'll take this as historic documents. You know, we can argue over, scholar, uh, over the authorship and we can over, uh, argue over other things. But all these miracle stories, yeah, we need to take all that out. So you had German scholars in the 1800s doing this, early 1900s, taking it all out. And now we're just left with historical Jesus and start the whole historical Jesus movement. You go in any Barnes and Noble, you'll see these historical Jesus books all over the place. Y'all still follow me and still awake? So then you had another strain. You had another strain coming out of the reformers that said, well, uh, okay, if, if miracles authenticate apostolic office and the Pope is the ultimate apostolic office in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, so therefore we're going to reject all that. Miracles no longer authenticate apostolicity, so we're just going to say we don't need miracles for any of that. And there was the seed planted there, really, in the reformers that brought down to today when it was matured in the 1800s at places like Princeton under B.B. Warfield and A.A. A. Hodge and Charles Hodge and guys like that. Brilliant and wonderful evangelical scholars, but they basically came down saying, you know what? We don't need miracles today. We don't need, and especially suspect, are these guys who go around claiming to heal people. And especially suspect are these guys who claim to have spiritual gifts and hearing from God and stuff like that. We can't have any of that. So, they formulated a doctrine that said that miracles were only good for the Bible times, that they were needed for the foundation of the church and the missionary endeavor of the church. And then once that was done, we no longer need miracles because now we have the canon of the New Testament and we have the Bible and that's all we need. Amen. Then, 1900, 
in a prayer meeting in Greenville, South Carolina at a little Bible college called Holmes Bible College. Someone speaks in unknown tongues. And they knew it was a sign. Then in a prayer meeting in a little Bible college in Topeka, Kansas, there was a lady who spoke with tongues on New Year's Eve service 1901. And the reports say she spoke and wrote in the Chinese language for three days. <laughs> then in Los Angeles, California, at a place called Azusa Street, a little holiness mission church, people started speaking in tongues and prophesying. And then they had divine miracles happening left and right and left and right. One reporter came from the LA Times to criticize the movement. And he said, I came in, I was going to write my critique of this crazy revival. And as I came to write my critique, I saw a young girl whose legs were crippled walk down the aisle. And as she came down the aisle, she started walking perfectly straight because God completely healed her. Amen. Then he said, a lady stood up and gave a message, a perfect a message in perfect fluent Russian. And he said, I knew it because I studied Russian in college. And she was telling about the glories of the Lord and how we should come to repentance and all this kind of stuff. So after the service, I went up to the lady and I said, lady, that was amazing. Where did you study Russian? I studied Russian in college. She said, honey, I've never been out of the state of California. I don't know what you're talking about. She was praying in the Holy Ghost. And now in the face of all this anti-miracle propaganda, we're looking at right now the Pentecostal charismatic third wave movement, we call it. We're looking at right now it being the strongest, most fervent religious movement on the planet Earth, numbering in the hundreds of millions. The Assemblies of God alone is ready to hit 60 million in membership worldwide, which will be as large as the Anglican Church globally. So in the irony of God, as mankind became so educated and so brilliant and didn't need miracles anymore, God went on the wrong side of the tracks and picked out some hungry folk and said, now I'm going to have my greatest display of my power in this earth realm and in this period of, of, of the earth. I'm going to pour out my spirit and I'm going to start a revival movement that no man can figure out. That no political power can trump or stop. That no force known globally in heaven above or hell below can come against and defeat. I'm going to set my church on fire and I'm going to take this planet back on fire before my return. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Oh, yeah. Somebody shout miracles. Come on, I still believe in miracles. Miracles didn't cease with the apostles. Miracles are just as much relevant today as they were when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. They're just as much relevant today as when Peter and Paul and John and all the apostles preached throughout Europe. They're just as needed and just as relevant today as any time in history. And my God knows we need miracles and we need power and we need anointing and we need God to come and shake a dead church and we need God to come and shake some religion out of some folk and put some Holy Ghost in some folk. We need miracles now. Give him a shout of praise. Well, I get excited. Amen. So I says, but there's no miracles really in the Bible. It's all mythology and all this. What are you smoking? Listen, Christmas is about miracle. That's why we stand back in awe. I love to see the, the Christmas lights. We do. I'm going to go to Dale and Carolyn's house. And just... It's awe. It's Christmas, man. Amen? My wife said it should be a law. You should be fined if you don't have Christmas lights up. So, so we don't, so we should be fined, I guess. But whatever. I'm working on it. We're going to get them up for Christmas. Hallelujah. <laughs> In the Old Testament, if you just look at the Old Testament, creation was a miracle. God did it by fiat, by just command, decree. He created everything. We see out of nothing. 
Do you know that? He created woman and, and, and man just out of the dirt of the earth. <coughs> Everything was by miracle, man. If I just look, I looked at a Bible list of miracles. So this is not exhaustive. I just want to throw out a few things. Creation was by fiat. The, the global flood was by miracle. The ten plagues were by miracle. Parting of the Red Sea, water from the rock, fire by day, cloud by night, Balaam's donkey that spoke, Samson's strength, disease upon the Philistines, thunder and rain at Gilgal, Uzzah smitten for touching the ark, Jeroboam's hand instantly withered and then restored. All by miracle. Jeroboam's new altar spontaneously destroyed at Bethel. The prophet was killed by the lion in 1 Kings. Widow's meal and oil was increased in 1 Kings. Resurrection of the widow's son in 1 Kings. Drought in response to Elijah's prayer. Supernatural fire in response to Elijah's prayer. Rain in response to the prophet Elijah's prayer. Ravens delivered food to the prophet Elijah. Fire from heaven as Ahaziah's captains were consumed by fire in, in 2 Kings. River divided, Jordan divided by Elijah and Elisha near Jericho. Supernatural transport, Elijah was carried up into heaven. Waters of Jericho healed by Elijah's casting salt onto them. Death, two bears miraculously destroy 42 young men immediately after they mocked the prophet Elisha. Water provided for Jehoshaphat and his allied armies in 2 Kings. Widow's oil multiplied, the Shunammite son raised back from the dead. Deadly pottage cured with meal at Gilgal. 100 men fed with 20 barley loaves. Instant disease and healing. Naaman, Naaman was instantly healed of leprosy as he dipped in the Jordan River. The iron axe head was made to swim in the River Jordan. Ben-Hadad's secret plans were revealed by the prophet of the Lord. The Syrian army was smitten with blindness at Dothan. The Syrian army healed of blindness at Samaria. Elijah's bones, Elisha's bones were so powerful, they threw a dead man on his bones, and the dead men came back to life. And we're just at 2 Kings. <laughs> and we could go on and on. The sun stands still. Yes. Uzziah struck with leprosy going into the house of the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego delivered deliver from the fiery furnace. Daniel saved from hungry lions. And Jonah survived in the belly of the fish. Gideon's fleece was dry and then it was wet. Many, many, many prophecies were fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Many prophecies were just fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. And then we come to the ministry of Jesus. Just the ministry of Jesus alone. Incarnation, miracle. Star of Bethlehem, miracle. Two blind men, healed, miracle. They needed money to pay taxes. Guess what happened? Jesus told the disciples to go fishing. They went fishing, opened up the fish, and there was the money to pay the taxes. Now, when has that happened recently to you? Blind man was healed at Bethesda. Deaf and dumb man healed in Mark chapter 7. Jesus went through a hostile crowd. They were attempting to murder him, and he passed unseen in Luke chapter 4. Hallelujah. There's a miraculous catch of fish in Luke chapter 5. The, the widow's son at Nain was raised from the dead in Luke chapter 7. There was a woman with a spirit of infirmity healed in Luke chapter 13. Man with the dropsy was healed in Luke 14. Ten lepers were healed in Luke 17. The ear of Malchus was placed back on his head after being chopped off in Luke chapter 22. Water turned to wine in John 2. Cure of the nobleman's son at Capernaum, John chapter 4. Important man of Bethesda healed in John chapter 5. A man born blind healed John chapter 9. Lazarus raised from the dead in John chapter 11. A miraculous draught of fishes instantly caught after Christ's instruction. John chapter 21. Syrophoenician's woman and her daughter was healed miraculously just by the word of Jesus. 4,000 fed in Matthew chapter 15 from seven loaves and a few little fish. The fig tree destroyed at Jesus' words. The centurion servant healed in Matthew chapter 8. The blind and dumb demonic cured in Matthew chapter 12. The demoniac cured in in the synagogue of Capernaum in Mark chapter 1, Peter's wife's mother healed in Matthew chapter 8. The sea stood still from a storm at the command of Jesus in Matthew chapter 8. Many demoniacs cured in Matthew chapter 8. 2,000 swine rushed into the water and drowned after Christ allowed demons to transfer to them from the demoniacs in Mark chapter 5. And we're not done yet. But there's no miracles in the Bible. You're smoking crack, man, is all I know. Amen. 
The leper's healed in Matthew chapter 8. Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead in Matthew chapter 9. Woman was healed of the issue of blood in Matthew 9. Man sick of the palsy healed in Matthew 9. Man's withered hand healed in Matthew 12. The lunatic child restored and healed to the parents in Matthew chapter 70. Two blind men instantly healed in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus feeds 5,000 in a desert place in Matthew chapter 14. He goes up on the mountain in Matthew 17 and he's transfigured before them. He raises from the dead in John chapter 21 and he does what no man can do. Coming out of the grave, hallelujah, death couldn't hold him. Hell couldn't stop him. Satan couldn't defeat him. He came out victorious. Give him a shout, hallelujah, Woo! for miracles. Yay, glory to God. Aren't you thankful that our God is a miracle working God? Yeah, but that's all Bible, Brother Hans. No, I look around this room today and I see miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Some of you shouldn't be here. Some of you should be in the grave right now. Some of you weren't going to make it. Some of you were addicted to drugs. Some of you were living in, in, in adultery. Some of you were living in sinful life. And God had mercy and God saved you. And God made your life count. And he brought you to this place. And he turned you around 180 degrees. And now you can stand in the sanctuary of the Lord. And you can say, I am the Lord's. Hallelujah. And I'm serving God. I'm baptizing the Holy Ghost. God separated me from this world. And now I'm a flame of fire in his house. Give Give him a shout, hallelujah. Come on, give him a praise, hallelujah. He's a miracle working God. Hey, somebody I know where I came from. There's no reason I should be right here, Mike, today. I think about Sister Anderson. She's in her 90s and she's here on a second roll today. And she told me she went to Oral Roberts meetings years ago as a young woman and she said when, when I got under that tent I felt the ground quake like an earthquake happened underneath my feet. My mother-in-law Ruby's been in the tent meetings with A.A. Allen and Oral Roberts and all those and she said she remember A.A. Allen coming in and they would bring people, the demoniacs. In those days they would chain them to the tent poles and Brother Allen would come and speak and the demons would come out and they'd come off their sick beds and come out of their beds of affliction. And the God who was in the 50s and the 40s is still the same God in 2016. I remember the story of T.L. Osborne who was a little poor boy from a farmland in Oklahoma and God called him into the Pentecostal Church of God and he became a missionary. He went to India and he was unsuccessful as a missionary in India because he said something was missing and it was miracles. And he came back to the United States and went to a meeting one night in the state of Washington and he walked in and he heard a man named William Branham and he said, Brother Branham got in the pulpit and he brought a, a cross-eyed girl before the whole congregation and he prayed for that girl gently in the name of Jesus and her eyes went back perfectly straight. And Brother Osborne said, I was in the balcony and it was as if a thousand voices spoke to me and said, you can do the very same thing with your life. And he went overseas and began some of the first mass crusade revivals that have ever been known. And I have a dear friend who's mentored his life after him and his name is Doug Eccles. And I have other friends that meant through their lives after T.L. I'm telling you, God is still in the miracle working business. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't know I was going to get this turned up today, but it's all right. Amen. So I have a man contact me from Pakistan. I meet, actually I meet him in Turkey and we had a wonderful time of fellowship. Then I meet him later in West Virginia of all places at a camp meeting and then he, co he, he contacts me I gave him a copy of the book I wrote now he contacts me this year and he says pastor we want to translate your book and I said well I don't have any money to do that he said don't worry about it we'll do it so they translated my book into Urdu that's the language of Pakistan and he sent me an electronic copy of it. And it's crazy looking, man. I can't verify if it's a correct translation because there's no way on earth I can read Urdu. And I said, what do you want to do with it? So we need money to get it published, though, now. 
And he said, what do you want to do with it? I, I said, what do you want to do with it? He said, I want to hand it out at our crusades. I said, okay. So I go on his Facebook page, and I look at his crusades. And his crusades in Karachi, Pakistan, and in Lahore, Pakistan, are not just 5,000 people, 10,000 people. This looks like hundreds of of thousands gathering. And they gather and they proclaim the name of Jesus. They call them festivals. And there's demons cast out. I said, have you ever encountered anyone from like another religion that you've cast? He said, I've cast out many spirits named Muhammad. <laughs> and we're afraid to go to Walmart, talk to somebody about Jesus. And he's living where they bomb churches. And if he speaks against the prophet, he can be beheaded. So I'm thinking, yeah, you can translate my book. Maybe leave the picture off the back. <laughs> Just kidding. Why? Because God's still doing miracles. He's doing miracles in Pakistan, man, like crazy. He's going to do miracles in Kathmandu and Nepal like crazy. Because you know what? This is what the world needs right now. They need a gospel that's full of faith and miracles, and God still does the miraculous. And He's still the God of Christmas, and no wonder the world hates Christmas. No wonder they hate the, the manger scenes. Why? Because every time they look at a manger scene, it offends their rationale, and it offends their pride that they couldn't figure this thing out, that God had to come and do it without man being involved. Whew. All right. I feel like I've run a marathon. Let's all stand up right now. Hold on. Hold on, Sue. i got to do something very important right now. Come on, we're going to pray right now. I believe God's going to do miracles in your lives today. Amen? Amen? And that's what we're here for. It's what I'm preaching for. I'm preaching for response. And I believe, I, I, I felt it in the first service that there's many of you who have come in here with needs and I'm not going to let this moment go by unless you have an opportunity to meet that, to, for God to meet that need and for your life to be changed. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So let's bow our heads right now. Come on, everybody with me. And if you need a miracle in your life today, I want you to just raise your hand and say, Pastor, I need a miracle right now. I need a miracle in my life. Come on, don't be ashamed. I'm, nobody's judging you here. You, you need a miracle in your life, a miracle in your family right now. Come on, we're going to believe God to do it. Father, right now, as these hands are raised, God, I pray for miracles to happen. And Lord, we're not just coming in hope, but we're coming in full expectation and full faith, believing that what you're going to do is awesome today, God. And God, I pray right now, Lord, that you, 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 you wade through all of our stuff and visit us where we are right now. And God, you do what man can't do. And you show up and overshadow these people by the Holy Spirit and do what man can't do today, Father. Come on, give me some faith working in this building right now. And God, we believe you for healing miracles. We believe you for family miracles, God. We believe you for children coming back home that's wayward, God. We believe you for alcoholics being delivered, God. We believe you for drug addicts being delivered, God. We believe you, Lord, for law, those involved in the cult turning around, God. We believe you for Elizabeth City being saved, Lord. We believe you for revival coming back to North Carolina, coming back to the United States, God. We believe you, Lord, for miracles in here today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, if you're not serving the Lord, you raise your hand right now. Come on, if you're not serving the Lord, you need prayer right now. I want you to, I want to pray for you right now. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I need the Lord in my life more than anything else. Let me see your hands. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Thank you, guys. I need the Lord in my life. Come on, thank you. I need the Lord more than anything else. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray right now. Father, y'all pray it with me. Father, come into my life. Thank you for taking away the doubt, taking away the unbelief, and injecting faith into my heart. I believe that Jesus is the Lord. I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day after dying for my sins. And I accept him as my Savior in the name of Jesus. And I give him praise from this day forward. And we can all shout hallelujah. And we can all give the Lord praise right now. Come on, give him a shout of praise. <laughs>